And Sister Jones, God bless you. Okay. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Edie. God bless you. I hear you coming in. God bless you all. Iris Cooper. Sister Cooper, God bless you, dear. Thank you. God bless Amen. you. Amen. Thank you for you all's prayer and support and prayer for support. Amen. Thank the Lord for you. Amen. Hey, God bless you, Sister Edie, Sister Freeman. God bless you. Hey, Sister Tawana, God bless you. Good thanks for joining us. Sister Davis, God bless you. Hello, Mother dear. God bless you. Yeah, I'm fine. God bless you. God bless you, Mother. God bless you, Sister Davis. Appreciate you. Hello there, Sister Deborah Gomes. Amen. Sister Mary McClendon, we bless the Lord for both of you and all of you that are coming in. And we give God the glory, the honor, and the praise for another day, another opportunity to be an instrument in the Lord's hand, to be an encouragement to the body of Christ as we withstand. And God bless you. We withstand and face the force uh, that's in our world, in our land. It's troubled so many, and yet it's causing us to prosper and to grow and to prevail by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm thankful for that. Hey, God bless you, dear. Thank you for joining us. Hey, good, welcome, uh, Sister Mary McClendon, uh, Brother Felix Duracell. God bless you, Brother Carlton and Sister Edith. Bless you all. Hey, God bless you. Uh, Sister Donna McKnight, hello there, Sister uh, uh, Vaughn. God bless you. Hey, Sister Valerie Murphy Point, bless you. Sister Alicia Sorrell, God bless you. Thank you all for being here. Amen. Bless the Lord. Well, we're going to go ahead and start with a word of prayer. <clears throat> the Bible declares that Jesus said men ought to always pray and not faint. Paul declares that we ought to pray without ceasing. He further declared that we ought to be devoted to prayer, instant in prayer. And so, God, here we come again tonight prayerfully, humbly, thankfully, and gratefully, eagerly and earnestly coming to you with anticipation and expectation that you will show yourself mightily to us through your word to encourage us as your people, as the body of Christ. So we humble ourselves before you, knowing that you will raise us up in due season. Empower your people. Empower the body of Christ. Empower my sisters and brothers this night and the days ahead as we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to him be all glory, honor, and praise. Now speak by your Holy Spirit's power through your word. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things from your word. And as we apply them to about our lives, we would never, ever be the same again. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. Good evening, Dr. Williams. <clears throat> and so we are covering what are we praying through. We began last night a new discussion of encouragement as we are learning how to pray through trying times. How to pray through trying times. And we're, <clears throat> we're up to the next major session uh, of prayer. And this is section or session, if you will, number five. I would say section, that'd be probably better. Number five, what are we praying through? What are we praying through? And we intro last night by helping us to understand you must, number one, identify what you are praying through. It is a context. You have to name the problem, the situation, the crisis, or the calamity. You have to name it. Name that context. 
what we are praying through. And then 1B, we, we have to discover what God has already said about it or done about the crisis, the situation, the problems, and the calamity, the trial, the tribulation. God has already spoken. And so we then must discover what God has already said. God bless you, Brother Victor. Uh, thank you for joining us. And so we want to encourage ourselves that we identify what we're praying through by naming it and discovering what God has said. And then we said, secondly, number two, you must develop a proper biblical worldview of what you are praying through. You must develop a proper biblical worldview of what you are praying through. And I didn't say this last night, but let me say this. 90% of Christians can say without a shadow of doubt they believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and they believe in his word. But if you ask them uh, what is their biblical worldview, only about 7 to 14% of the 90% can explain or articulate what a biblical worldview is. God bless you, Twala. Welcome to the call. Thank you so much, Twala, for joining us. Amen. Hey, Donna Harrison, God bless you. Hey, Alice Mentors, Maria Red Jackson, welcome to the time tonight. And so we need to understand that a biblical worldview is just that. It's, it's our lenses for how we see the world. And a biblical worldview helps us to articulate what we're seeing. And if we're not clear about it, that's where the Holy Spirit <clears throat> inspires us and gives us insight and illumination so that we can see the world properly uh, with our, and so when it comes time to pray through, uh, our biblical worldview becomes our prayer lenses for which we see what to pray for. And so, and so having said that, uh, 2A, <clears throat> our biblical worldview gives us the universal context of good and evil. There's a universal context of good and evil. We must understand and know that there's, God bless you, Sister May, but there's a context that we live in that is good and evil. There's a tension in our world. Always, always, always a tension between good and evil. <clears throat> and, and evil prevails when the good do nothing. Evil wins when the good is not stronger than evil. And that's why we've been told, don't call evil good and don't let good be called evil. And Paul says, let not your good be what? Evil spoken of. So there is this tension that we live in between uh, these two uh, polarities, good and evil. And so one, uh, to be, why does God allow? good and evil to exist, to coexist, since God is always, always, always good, and God is omni-everything. Why does God allow good and evil to coexist, and evil oftentimes to take advantage of the good? Why does God allow that? Well, uh, <clears throat> to see, we said, God allows it because humans are caught between good and evil. And they're caught between good and evil only for one reason and one reason only. Free will. All right? Free will. God has given humans the freedom to choose. It's called human liberty. Amen. God, God bless you. Hey, Pastor Baysmore, Brother George Porter, welcome, y'all. Sister Gail, welcome. And so God does this. God allows it because if God <clears throat> uh, were to wipe out evil... Uh-huh. Then guess what? He'd have to wipe every human being out. <laughs> and so we're caught in between both good and evil. Yeah, uh, uh, because we have in our flesh no good thing. There's a war going on inside of us. Yes, we are saved. Uh-huh. Uh -huh, but, but remember, there's a law in our members that's warring against 
and it's good and evil. And so the 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 the, the watch this. The one we feed the most is the one who uh, dominates. Amen. And, and so Paul tells us that's called a law. There's a law in it. So 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 God just can't extinguish. No no no. He can't do that because he gave humans the freedom to choose. And so 2D, 2D, <clears throat> good and evil exist on earth because of Adam and Eve. So when we understand what happened in the garden uh, with Adam and Eve, then we can appreciate biblical worldview through the right lens that Adam and Eve set on course all that we are experiencing even up to right now. It's a result of what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. And so that's the biblical worldview of good and evil. And watch this. And sin and its perniciousness and its domineering effect on who we are as created in the image of God. We had a perfect image, but it's a fallen image. Yet we still have the image of God on us. All right. And God has made us in his likeness. And so God does not wipe us out. Uh, he, he, he lovingly endures. We said the other day, he lovingly endures uh, this grief and this burden that humanity has caused and given to him because he's got a, he's got a great and awesome plan. And God's plan is for the benefit and the betterment of man. And, and we know that when we get into the study of the New Testament, you all know how to articulate that, so I'm not going to deal with that. And so we begin to read uh, from the two covenants. And I didn't mention this last night, uh, and so as I was reading back through it, I don't know why I was hastening through my notes, and y'all forgive me for that, but, but <clears throat> uh, Genesis 2.15 through 17 is the culmination. Genesis 2.15 through 17 is the culmination of, of the Edenic covenant, E-D-E-N-I-C. There was a covenant in Eden that God made with Adam and then Adam shared with his wife, Eve. It began in Genesis 1, 26, all the way up through Genesis 2, uh, 15 through 17. And so, uh, <clears throat> and and when, you, when we read that last night and we read that in the, uh, amplified Bible, we saw that what happened. And when they violated that covenant, and remember, covenants with God and covenants that are established by God uh, are broken in only one way. And they're broken by death. Uh -huh. They're broken by death. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, they first of all died spiritually. And then secondly, they died physically. And so there was a death that occurred. And so therefore God had to put in place an ultimate covenant. And we talk about that, but let me say this, the second covenant is what we've been reading about. And we didn't, I read up to the point and I told you, I pick up on it tonight. Uh, we stopped up at verse, um, uh, verse 13. Uh, and the woman said, and the Lord said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled, cheated, outwitted, and deceived me, and I ate. Now, beginning at verse 14, we now begin to hear God give another covenant, which is called the Adamic covenant, named after Adam for being man or human. Adamic covenant, A D A M. I see the Adamic covenant begins at verse 14. This is what he says. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all domestic animals and above every wild thing of the field upon your belly. You shall go and you shall eat dust and whatever it contains all the days of your life. So we automatically see right there that Satan uh, the, the serpent was cursed and part of the serpent's curse was that he would he lost his beauty uh, because when we read chapter one chapter six chapter three verse one following Satan was a beautiful I mean the serpent was a beautiful creature all right uh, and and he he lost 
uh, the serpent lost its beauty. All right. It was subtle and crafty and a living creature. It had beauty and it was very attractive. Uh, but now in the curse, uh, it now must go on its belly. It used to stand upright. Uh, now it's on its belly and it eats the dust and whatever is found in the dust. That's what he would live on uh -huh, uh, all the days of his life. <clears throat> that's, that's part of the Adamic covenant. Then he continues on with the devil. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise and tread upon your head. Un excuse me. He will bruise and tread your head underfoot and you will lie in wait and bruise his heel. And so this is now the first prophecy of Jesus Christ, the first evangelistic witness that God would send Jesus to destroy Satan and his works. And, and that's a prophecy. And then he said, so this 14 and 15 is the serpent and what would happen in relationship between man and humanity and the serpent. Many people are afraid of snakes. I, I, I'll be honest. I, I, I'm not afraid of all snakes, but there's some snakes I'm afraid of. The poisonous kind that bite. <laughs> and so I just want you to know, uh, uh, the, the little garden snakes, I can handle those. those. Other snakes that don't bite and not poisonous, I can live with them. But anyone that bites and is poisonous, you got a pastor that's going to run from that snake. Uh, or, or make sure that snake is taken care of, handled up and dealt with. Uh, while, while with some power uh, that I know is going to be dead, right? And so, and so there's this tension. Here it is. There's this good, evil tension, even in this. I hope you see where I'm going with that. And then he said to the woman, I will greatly multiply your grief and your suffering in pregnancy and the pains of childbearing. With spasms of distress, you will bring forth children. Your desire and craving will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And this desire and craving means desire and craving for his position. And so, see, if it was if it was if it was romantic desire and craving, then it would make sense. But but, but the next statement tells uh, what the problem is. And watch this. And he will what rule over you. See, and that means because you wanted to be in his place, then now you're subjugated uh -huh, until, watch this, until the end of time, positionally, not creatively, but positionally. And that's always been a tension, and it still is a tension, all right? And, and, and that's another day for another discussion. Verse 17, and he said to Adam, because you have listened to, and given heed to listen to this, the voice of your wife. So who should Adam have been listening to? He said who he was listening to, the voice of God. And, but when he heard the voice of God, he ran. Why? Because he heard the voice of his wife and she convinced him to eat. And so God calls out Adam's problem. He calls out Adam's problem. And it's a universal Adamic covenant that oftentimes, not all the time, but oftentimes, uh, it's a problem uh, <clears throat> when men are lured away from their responsibility with God. And so, and so he said, watch this, you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you. He didn't say I commanded y'all. He said I commanded you saying you shall not eat of it. The ground is under a curse. Notice what's been cursed. The ground is under a curse. Oh, Wow. Adam and Eve are punished. The serpent is cursed and all the creation is cursed. Adam and Eve are punished. It's their punishment. People call it a cursing. Never hear, he's, never hear God say curse to Adam and Eve. No, 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 no. He said curse to the serpent. He said curse to all the other animals. He said you are cursed above all the other animals. And now you are cursed above. And, and, and watch this. And the whole creation is cursed. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, 20 and 21 that the, the, the earth creation is groaning because of the curse that Adam and Eve put it into. And they're waiting for deliverance of the sons and daughters of God. And so it's, it goes all the way back to this Adamic covenant. But this Adamic covenant has cursing in it. Amen. And so it's cursed. 
and it's the curse because of you in sorrow now and toil you will eat of the fruits of it all the days of your life thorns and thistles also shall it bring forth for you and you shall eat the plants of the field in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve life spring because she was the mother of living. For Adam also and for his wife, the Lord made long coats, tunics, if you will, of skins and clothed them. So this is what you hear. This is the Adamic covenant and all of those things that God enumerated. There are nine specifics that he enumerated that goes with the Adamic covenant. Now here's the beauty, y'all. And here's something that was intriguing as I studied in the language. Um, uh, th th this pattern, uh, God is always strategic. Man is strategic. Satan is strategic. God is strategic. Mm -hmm. And man learns to be strategic. And, and so we, we want to show you that. All right? Uh, and we thank God for all of our guests still coming in. We appreciate you coming in. Watch this, y'all. Therefore the Lord sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Listen to verse 23. So God drove the man and so God drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep and guard the way to the tree of life. God realized that the tree of life was still accessible to Adam and Eve. And if Adam had gone and taken a bite from the tree of life, he would have been perpetually lost. He would be perpetually locked in evil. He would be perpetually done for. And there would be nothing that God could do to undo that because of the choice that Adam made and would have locked everybody into that eternal life of evil. Thank God he drove him away out of the garden and then put a, 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 a cherubim, all right? And put cherubim and, and, and these are angels. These are fighting angels, warring angels with a flaming sword which turned every which way to keep them out of the garden. In other words, uh, east, west, north, or south, as some scholars would say, there was no way into this place without access to God. And so that's how it is today. You don't have access to God except through one way. And that way is Jesus Christ. And so God, God had a plan. Uh, that eternal life can now still be uh, enjoyed and can still be experienced. That is, watch this, y'all, that is the context Every time we look at an issue in life, it begins at the beginning. But what your lens that you have, it may not immediately register, but you got to understand. Evil, suffering, good, bad, uh, whatever, all is a part of God's ultimate plan before the foundation of the world. So that's the lens by which we must now look at stuff. Now, having said that, let's hasten on. Letter E, 2E. Satan's temptation of humanity established his pattern and methodology for dealing with humanity. Satan's temptation of Adam and Eve established his pattern and his methodology for dealing with humanity. There are four methods that you find in verses 1 through 6. In verses 1 through 6, there are four uh, methods that Satan has established that never, ever changes. They're always the same. Satan has a methodology, and he has four methods that he uses all the time. And that's why it's key for us to know it. That's what the biblical worldview comes to. I'm giving you a biblical world because once you see this, you'll see Satan, wherever he is, he's doing these four things all the time. Number one, verse one, it says, now the serpent was more subtle than crafty living creatures of the field 
that the Lord God had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, can it really be that God has said, you shall not eat from every tree of the garden? The first thing Satan does, he questions God. The questioning of God is Satan's number one methodology. The questioning of God in order to distort the truth. Questioning of God is distorting the truth. Casting doubt on the word of God. Now remember, here's the law first mentioned. The very first law of Satan and his subtlety and his ways is questioning God and distorting the truth. Questioning and distorting the truth. In other words, bringing doubt to the human, human mind about the word of God. All right? That's what Satan does. Okay? And so, watch this. By the way, let me, let me share this. This piece right here helps us. Do you not know Satan is powerless over us until we assent and give consent? He can't do anything to us unless we assent. He's gotten permission to go roaming throughout the earth right? But he cannot have access unless we assent or consent to it, right? And, and, and that means to let him have authority over us. No, no, no. He doesn't have authority over us. All right. That's right. We have to give in to him. And so, so, so man gave in. Adam gave in. Eve was deceived, but Adam gave in. And so Eve assented and Adam consented, <laughs> assent, consent. You see the language there. And so that's the number one methodology. Number two, all right, contradicting God, contradicting God. That is denying God's word totally. And by the way, this is a natural result of questioning God. If you continue questioning God, the natural result is you're going to ultimately deny God. Because if you don't get the answer from God like you think you should get and you're still questioning, then you come to the point where it must not be true. Right? And that's that's a natural that's what Satan wants. All right. You'll find that in verse number four. Questioning God. Listen to what listen to what he says. But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. You shall not. He flat out just says God's word ain't true. What God said is he called God a liar. <laughs> That's what he did. He called God a liar. All right. The third methodology is exceeding God. Exceeding God. What do you mean, Pastor, here by exceeding God? Verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. You see that right there? This is what he said. He said, see, God is really trying to hold you back. God is really holding out on you because he knows that, that you will become like him. And, 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 and he doesn't want you to become like him. He doesn't want you to have what God has. He doesn't want you to know what he knows. And so God knows uh, that uh, some stuff that you don't get to know. But I want to tell you, Eve, nah, you, you just need to know. Uh, that God is playing y'all. And so it's to exceed. In other words, it's a subtlety, it's a satanic trick in which some imaginable good <laughs> is being sought above and beyond what God has already offered. In other words, he's saying, listen, there's more to what God has, has said. There's more to what God has promised. I, I'm telling you, there's more to it and, and God is holding out on you. And that's the idea here of exceeding God. In other words, if, if I can get you to believe me that there's more to what God is saying, then you then you begin to see yourself as God. And Satan knows that plan doesn't work. That got him put out of heaven. And then lastly, um, lastly, uh, for tonight also, because my time is coming and going, I tell you this time, this time flies by. Lastly, disobeying God, disobeying God. Verse six, you know what happened. And... They ate of the fruit. They disobeyed what God said. Disobeying God is the ultimate result that begins with questioning God, contradicting God, exceeding God, which leads to disobeying God. And disobeying God got 
Satan kicked out of heaven and Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden. Notice everything ends with a being kicked out. <laughs> when you deal with the devil, it ends up with a being kicked out of something. Satan got kicked out of heaven and Adam and Eve got kicked out of, this is the proper world you got to understand. You got to see Satan right. You got to see humanity right. You got to see God right. You got to see the conditions right. You've got to understand all of this is a part of the greater good that God has empowered us to have, but we cannot, watch this, we, we can't get caught up into this distraction by the devil through this four-point methodology, questioning God, mm-hmm, contradicting God, mm-hmm, trying to exceed God, and then disobeying God. And so I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that this is a biblical worldview that we have to look at life from this frame of reference and context. And this also uh, is part of the nine point of the Adamic covenant. So why do I say that? Because as we look at what's going on in our world, we now know how to pray with proper consciousness, seeking and searching the will of God. Amen. Not just praying words, because we can pray words all outside, everywhere, but if you don't have specificity, you don't know how to ask right. You don't know how to prevail in prayer. You don't know how to fast and pray. You don't know how to condition yourself. You don't know how to confess your sins. You don't know how to give God praise. You don't know how to thank him. You don't know how to pray for yourself and others. Amen. Hey, Dr. Buxton, God bless you, man. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Hey, Bishop, God bless you. Sister Janine, appreciate you so much. And all of our other pastors that have joined us, bless you. Brother Michael Bass, Marvetta Mosley, uh, uh, Peggy Goulet, all of y'all, thank you for joining us so much. And so having said that, I conclude with this thought. When we understand the purpose of God for humanity, and when we understand what was offered with the Edenic covenant and what was violated and terminated, and what's now in the Adamic covenant, or the Adamic covenant, however you want to say it, uh, uh, now you got a perspective. Watch this. You have a prayer lens, a biblical context by which you see the world and by which you now seek and search for God's will to be done. And your prayer life is crucial and critical as we are praying through something. And we got to know the principles and practices of prayer. And I'm so encouraged by my pastor and friend, Brother Buxton, who's teaching them one of the greatest methods of prayer, the Acts method, and he's been doing a fantastic job with that. And so, brothers and sisters, that's where we are. We'll stop right there. Uh, we'll pick up on tomorrow looking at Satan's pattern of temptation, how it affects us in threefold ways. It affects us three ways. And you, you got to get that. So now you know his methodologies. And then his methodologies affects our total humanity if we're not careful because all three have to shun him or we'll be ineffective in our prayer life. And so God bless you. May God keep you. I thank God for your presence being with us tonight. God bless you, Brother Dickens. God bless you, Sister Joan Red, Sherry Stanfield, and others who've joined us. We appreciate all of you on tonight. Let's look to God in a closing prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time of giving us insight giving us illumination, giving us understanding, giving us revelation, helping us to see ourselves as we see you, as well as we see our enemy, our adversary, a force against us who's seeking like a roaring lion to find out who he may devour. And so God, we thank you that we can resist him firm in the faith as we draw near to you. Resist the devil and he will flee. So bless now my sisters and my brothers. Bless us as we go out and we come in. Bless us in the fields and bless us in the home. Bless us in our labor. Bless us in our leisure. Help us to keep our mind fixed and stayed on you because you've promised to give us perfect peace whose mind are stayed on you because we trust in you. Trust in the Lord for the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. So Lord, we thank you and receive your grace and your mercy. Your mercies are fresh and unlimited. They're new every morning. And great is your faithfulness for us, to us. And we thank you now. Give us a good night of rest, Lord, and refresh us and wake us in the morning with happiness and joy and delight to serve you by showing the love and sharing the love of Jesus Christ. 
and praying through this difficult time, praying through with biblical lenses, prayer lenses to help us to understand what we're praying about and how to go about praying to make a difference in times like these. And I ask this prayer by faith with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey guys, I love you. May God be with you. Take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.